the thing last night, as I said at the beginning, but it may have been lost in the shuffle, is a kind of indulgence to me because it's a completely original idea. And like all original ideas, it has a strong, runs a strong risk of being just simply wrong. But because what it seeks to do is so grandiose and because it seems to do it to some degree, and then that, of course, falls upon the the eye of the beholder to assess, it seems worth communicating uh, as an example. It, if you don't choose to believe it or take it to your heart, then as an example, what it can function for you as is a picture of the sorts of ideas that are out there, the kinds of uh, insights that we can draw out. And people, always in these things, we discuss what could be done, what should be done, what can we do other than what we're doing to make that kind of a world come to be uh, or come closer to be. And my notion is simply uh, uh, art. That, that I, as I think I told you at some point, the idea is not to confront bad ideas, but to come up with good ideas. Otherwise, your enemies define the game, and you are the loyal opposition. And, you know, how many years have we been the loyal opposition? And hasn't it been an unsatisfying experience? So uh, I think every single one of us has immense inner resources. And the psychedelics confirm that. I, and by inner resources, I mean of intelligence and information and beauty. And uh, I think we would be happier people, and this would be a better world if we uh, spent more time bringing that out rather than opposing somebody else's vision of what is happening. The I Ching says at one point, if evil is directly confronted and named, it it perfects weapons to defend itself. It says in any direct confrontation with evil, you, you show it, you reflect too much of it back upon itself, and it learns to defend itself. And the strategy then is one of stealth, I think. And, you know, beginning at least with, oh, I don't know, it's just an art historical game, but let's say the pre-Raphaelites, there have been these waves of aesthetic and social dissent. Uh, I mentioned the pataphysics movement in France in the 1890s. Dada and surrealism and uh, the abstract expressionists and the beats and the hippies and the punks. I mean, these different tones, different adumbrations, but always the same message, which is that satisfaction and completion can't be found uh, within the official culture. And, um, you know, I, I came up into that. I was born and raised in an incredibly conventional situation by very loving parents in a pleasant environment, and uh, I just couldn't wait to break their hearts and get away to sin and the big cities and, uh, and uh, all of that. Uh, so the important message to take out of all of this, I think, for people in your position who may or may not wish to grapple with abstract mathematical models of time or trade with naked aboriginals in steaming jungles, what can you take into your own life? It seems to me what the whole thing, the tension between these 
bohemian countercultural critiques and bourgeois society is about is what I call uh, the primacy of direct experience. You know, if you are a, a inside a Christian world or a capitalist world or a Jewish world or a Republican world or a democratic world. These are worlds of ideas. These are ideas. And we can live by ideas, but we can't live by ideas alone. It makes, it creates megalomania. It creates unbalance. It creates a, a grotesque parody of what life is supposed to be about. And what life, I think, is supposed to be about is the reclamation of the primacy of direct experience. And that means sex and psychedelics and dancing and conversation and good eating and lots of exercise and travel and uh, attention to what Wittgenstein called the present at hand. The present at hand, meaning what you can reach is what's real. And everything else, you know, becomes progressively more hypothetical, more abstract. Anticipating Wittgenstein talking about uh, uh, our reach, William Blake said, attend the minute particulars. This was his advice for life. Attend the minute particulars. Well, that's good uh, 18th century prose for pay attention to the details. Keep your eye on the ball. It, the, the, the nexus of mystery and of uh, being and the theater of our drama of redemption is the body. The body. And uh, we have been thoroughly weirded out on the subject of the body because we have been the inheritors of a very complex, head-oriented, abstraction uh, devoted social system, cultural theory. But we see the consequences of not feeling all around us. I mean, the toxification of the earth the toleration of overpopulation uh, and the institutions that promote it is all achieved through a deadening of feeling. If we could feel what we are doing to the earth, to the elderly, to the young, to racial and, and uh, social minorities, if we could feel the agony of what we do, we would stop doing it. But we have what we call reasons for why it is the way it is. Arguments, theories, blame, you know, it's somebody else's fault or, or the poor are always with us or, or something else. But these are all evasions of the obligation to create a community based on love and tolerance. Hardly a radical notion and yet incredibly difficult to bring into existence and uh, you know perhaps the world will transform itself in 2012 and we need have no further concern uh, about all these things but perhaps not we we need to live our lives in the light of the assumption of an open future, not an absolutely free future, but not a determined future, an open future in which acts of uh, human authentication, acts of human authenticity push forward the universal project of the conservation of novelty. You know, Martin Heidegger, uh, the German metaphysician, the way he got it together was he said, what life is for 
is what he called care for the project of being. Care for the project of being. This is what we are called to. Again, Heidegger's phrase. We are called to care for the project of being. And that means an appreciation of the minute particulars, an appreciation and a recognition of difference, an appreciation and a recognition of our position in the cosmos, which is both insignificant and paradoxically grandiose at the same time. You know, Pascal said, man is a reed bent by the wind, but he is a thinking reed. And that's the paradox of our being, our fragileness in nature, and yet the the, the, the supernatural grandiosity that we sense in the hallways of our souls. And shamanism is uh, not religion, really, at its, at its fundamental level. It's, it's, it's the science of direct experience. Other forms of science may deal with the states of the quanta or the orbits of the Pleiades, but shamanism is the science of direct experience. And its laboratory is the human body and the human nexus in space and time. You know, you're given, on average, 60, 70 years, and on average, 145 pounds of meat. And this is what you're dealt the meat and the time and then it's up for you up to you to sort this out and make of it what you will and the the entropic path the downward path into uh, blame unhappiness self blocking so forth and so on that's always there you know you can release yourself into the river of uh, consequences and take no responsibility for who you are but uh, the higher stakes game the more interesting game is to see uh, the whole thing as an opportunity Heidegger I'm amazed I'm quoting Heidegger so much this morning Heidegger again he said the body is not a thing nor is it a process, which is surprising because that's considered an advanced view that it is a process. He said it is not a thing, nor is it a process. It is a window of opportunity which opens into eternity. It's a window of opportunity. But opportunity implies the non-exercise of itself. An opportunity is something which you must seize. It doesn't press itself upon you. It doesn't force itself upon you. It merely is there if you want to use it. And I, I, my approach to life and the whole Megilla is that it's like a puzzle. It's a mystery. It, it is a koan. And salvation occurs simultaneously through an act of love that's not news but here's news simultaneously through an act of love and an act of rational apprehension understanding love without understanding is not the full story real love requires understanding rational apprehension is a kind of penetration of the beloved person, nation, e ecosystem, whatever the beloved is. Understanding is the higher dispensation. And these psychedelics, which, you know, in the, f in the 60s and 50s were simply called consciousness-expanding drugs, good old phenomenological description, if there's an iota of possibility that they expand consciousness, 
then we must put our attention on this area because it is the absence of consciousness that is making our situation so very uncomfortable. People going for the fast buck, people elbowing their neighbor and their neighbor's concerns out of the way, trampling over each other. Low consciousness activity is, uh, is the problem. And as concerned people, as intelligent people, as people of wealth and leisure, and you know, you may think you're scraping bottom, but the lowest among us here is still in the upper 5% of the elites of this planet because you just don't get here any other way. So upon us devolves a certain uh, responsibility, not only for ourselves, but, you know, the average human being on this planet is a 23-year-old black woman with two children. A certain responsibility toward that concrescence of the human experience. So, I, my, the thing I just want to leave you with is that uh, though this has been very heady and egg-heady, which is how I am, uh, we have not, we have talked ideas, but we have not laid out a method or a dogma or a program. There's nothing to sign up for. There's no higher level of initiation if you give me $1,500 or anything like that. What we have been celebrating here is an experience, and we haven't had the experience. We've just talked about it and analyzed it and anticipated it. But it is there to be had out there in nature with nothing between you and it. Uh, You know, to steal from Van Morrison, no guru, no method, no teacher, just you and me and Mother Nature in the garden in the garden, wet with rain. And uh, you may choose to hear this message and, and then life will continue for you as it has with the tools you have in your toolkit. Or you can choose to go out there and meet it. But it's not an easy path because it's the real path. And the fear is real, and the risk is real, and the reward is real. It's beyond hype, which is for us almost unimaginable, because everything comes clothed in in, uh, flamboyant self-anticipation. And it's, uh, in a sense, a secret, and yet paradoxically, a secret which can be freely told of, as we've told of it here. But the human mind has an incredible capacity to turn away from uh, challenge, opportunity, uh, uh, risk. So um, what I want to remind you is that we, we, we only circled around the mystery We used our intellectual flashlights. We saw glimpses of it. But the the real uh, meat of this path is, uh, you know, alone in silent darkness on five grams or something or something. Plotinus, the great Neoplatonist philosopher of the Byzantine Empire and a great mystic, spoke of the mystical apotheosis as the flight of the alone to the alone. And I've always, <clears throat> I've always thought that was an excellent uh, program for how to meet the psychedelic experience. It is a mystery. It is not an unsolved problem. It's a true mystery. And uh, we are not accustomed to this. I've searched the world for mysteries, and I've found illusions, fraud, 
misunderstanding, uh, obfuscation, impenetrable complexity, but never true mystery, except in this one tiny, tiny area of the chemical and biological world. And there, for, I guess because, you know, in the greater plan, everything must exist, and so therefore must magic. But it is it, the doorway to it, the doorway into that world, is a very <coughs> confined spot in the vast data field of this world. And you, can, you could miss it, although I'm doing my best to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, where spiritual advancement is discussed, I want psychedelics to be discussed. Where uh, transformative social visions are put forth, I want psychedelics to be part of the agenda. Uh, to me, the only thing you can compare it to is sexuality on one level, but it's different from sexuality because sexuality is written into the bones. You, very few people can go from birth to the grave and escape it in some form, some confrontation. I mean, even the celibate monk, basically his life is a confrontation with sexuality in that form. Uh, the psychedelic experience is very different. You can go from birth to the grave and never even hear of it. And millions and millions of people have. But, but they were, uh, and I don't say this in a blaming sense, uh, it's a tragedy, they were infantilized by their circumstances in time and space. They never experienced that dimension of freedom. It's like having an automobile and you drive it around and it seems to work fine, but there's this button on the dashboard and you never investigate to find out you know, what it does, what it is. And there is in us this switch which can only be thrown by forming, well, until the era of modern science very recently, could only be thrown by forming a relationship with a plant, with, a, with a, a, an entirely different order of being. And when that switch is thrown, this entire other dimension of humans is revealed. And it is, uh, it is uh, you can tell, even if you've never been there, from the excited testimony, her hysterical denunciations, and passionate defenses, that it is an area charged with meaning for the human experience. So I, I hope that this, uh, this get-together inspires you to go further and go deeper. I think that uh, there's no other game in town doing art without this in your experience is essentially like trying to do art without good light. Trying to live a life without the illumination of this experience is a far more difficult thing because what do you have to guide you? The secular faiths, the religious faiths, and the obvious confusion that both have spread in their wake. Uh, uh, sexuality is a path to a kind of authenticity, but it has to be negotiated with another human being in a very careful and subtle dance of energy. This is not like that. This is something where you... You, there is a subtle dance of energy, but it's not with a, another human being. It's with, and then you can either think of it as a mushroom, or God, or the universe itself, or Gaia. It will take all those projections with equal ease. So somehow, 
each of you from different pasts and with different futures have come through this place where we were all cotangent for four days. And uh, if, if you are not a psychedelic person and you, through the fact of having been here, become one, then you will look back on this weekend as a primary turning point in your process of simply growing and growing up and uh, in and and for those of if that happens to you that is uh, the satisfaction of my work as I say I'm I, I don't think of myself as a guru I think of myself as a doorman and I'm very happy to see people pass in to uh, the four-star experience that lies uh, <laughs> through <laughs> the fogged and etched glass. <clears throat> um, and that's really all I have to say. Um, I'll entertain uh, loose end questions or if anybody wants to say anything or whatever needs to be done, now we can do it. But thank you very, very much. And and I look forward to seeing you all downstream some sooner, some later, eventually uh, at the general judgment, uh, whether it occurs in 2012 or on some more extended scale, we will all uh, uh, stand uh, in the same place. Yeah, yeah. I had asked you once to give me your definition of the soul. I've heard many people try to define it, and I just like to hear your definition. Yeah, well, it's a complicated thing. It has a long history, because there's the the idea of spirit is in there, and so is the idea of intellect. And these spirit, soul, intellect, various philosophies have moved them around. Uh, I think of the soul as a kind of um, Mm. Well, you know how I think we can assume that we all have a pancreas, but probably no one here has ever seen their pancreas. Well, that's because it's in a place, it's in a dimension that's rarely revealed, i.e. within the confines of the tissue of your body. I think of the soul as a hyper-dimensional organ. It, it's, it's an organ uh, that you can't see, like the pancreas. But if you open up the body, you will see the pancreas. You won't see the soul. But if you were to rise up into a higher mathematical dimension, what you, a, a human being would look like a worm because the worm would extend from birth to death all the intermediate states would be there. The entire lifetime would be perceived in a single moment. And uh, I, that's how I think of the soul. The soul is not who you are now. The soul is who you are and will be and have been. So it's yourself extended in time. You know, Plato said, time is the moving image of eternity. And what we were doing last night, in a way, was looking uh, at snapshots of that moving image. I think that, if, that at death, if the soul survives then in a sense what happens is you flow back through your entire life and it exists all at once in a single moment. I mean, that's the paradox of hyperspace, that, uh, that what, is, what is serially presented in, in Newtonian space is holistically apprehended in, in hyperspace. And similarly, there is a group soul, a group mind, 
and all the same processes apply. Uh, in a way, the transcendental object at the end of time is history. History, you know, I think I said, at least I think, that uh, history is like a psychedelic experience. And we are building toward the apotheosis, the place where language fails, where you, the ego dissolves. You can no longer make sense of it. It's been getting weirder and weirder. And finally, the speed at which the weirdness is accumulating just avalanches over you and you can no longer make sense of it. But the... An idea which I didn't talk about very much in this workshop, but that's dear to my heart, is the idea of the philosopher's stone. Uh, in the 16th century in Europe, um, before the rise of modern science and chemical theory, the ontological distinction between world and self was not as strongly defined as it is in modern people. And consequently, people working with substances entered into a kind of participation mystique in which the contents of the unconscious were actually projected onto matter. And the, Carl Jung made much of this because he realized that these alchemical texts, which are so cryptic and bizarre, could be treated like dreams because they were downloads of unconscious material. But I, I think that the alchemists were, in a sense, on the right track in that what is being sought in the concrescence, what the essence of the thing at the end of the world is, is it's a union of spirit and matter, is what it is. And it's a union of spirit and matter that occurs in such a way that each retains the characteristics that it brought into the union. In alchemical terms, this is called a coincidencia positorum. In modern terms, it's not allowed. It's a logical contradiction. But I think that the essence of understanding the world is to be able to hold a logical contradiction in your mind uh, and, and not force things to be either or. And uh, the philosopher's stone is the idea that you could have a kind of matter. I mean, think of it as a small pebble which is yet somehow made of mind and hence is an object freely commandable in the imagination. And they sought this. They tried to make this. This was a technological agenda uh, from 1540 up until the Thirty Years' War. Uh, and the universal panacea you know, the panis super substantiales, all these terms for this lapis, this stone. And what it is, is it's a place in space and time where anything can happen. Anything can happen. So imagine that what we are involved in collectively and each of us is an effort to give birth to the soul to somehow cause the soul to come into existence. One way of thinking about this, I think I said this earlier, but it probably means more now, is that the historical enterprise is an effort to turn the human body inside out so that the soul becomes visible and the body becomes a process that you can command in the imagination. Do you understand what that would look like? It, so, here's a, so then here's the, the comic book version of what I'm talking about. Here we have the Philosopher's Stone. I have just, it, by a cryptobiological process, regurgitated it into my hand, and here it is. Okay, so it's my soul objectified outside my body.
It ha it's a holographic matrix of space and time. When you look into it, you can see stars in there. And uh, if you need to go somewhere, you stretch it out and sit on it. And it carries you there. And if you're hungry, you eat it. And if you need a shower, it becomes a levitating shower head above your head from which warm water pours. And if you need to know something, you ask it. And if you need to wear something, it becomes it. And what it is, is it's a union of matter and your imagination. And you say, well, such a thing could only happen in a dream. Well, quite right. I think we may be headed into a dream, either the after-death dream or the nano-cyber-technological dream or the pharmaco-shamanic dream. Uh, we are headed into some kind of a dream. We are going to live in the imagination. And the imagination is the domain of the soul. I mean, I'm not kidding. <laughs> we are going to live in the imagination. It will cease to be metaphor. It will become real estate. That's how real the imagination is going to be. And it may be virtual reality, pharmacological reality, after death reality, nanotech reality. We'll find a way. We will find a way. Because I think that this union of spirit and matter is an agenda in the human uh, program that runs very, very deep. This is why we spoke for the first time. Language is a union of spirit and matter. The spirit of the thinking mind and the very ephemeral matter of the air, which can carry an acoustical signal. The word is on its way to becoming flesh. Wasn't that the promise? And similarly, the flesh is on its way to becoming word. That's what all that raving is all about. The language is a, a partial condensation of the philosopher's stone. So is a 747. It will carry you places. All technology is the effort to create ultimately the ultimate tool. The ultimate tool. And what can the ultimate tool do? And what is the ultimate tool for? The ultimate tool can do anything. Obviously, that's what the ultimate tool is. Well, now it's very interesting that we have arrived in the last 40 years or so into the realm of the, the cybernetic machine because it has a different ontos than previous tools. I don't know how much you know about computers, but think of a com uh, what all a computer is, even the most sophisticated of computers, is an enormous set of switches. And so here you have a machine with 50 million switches. Set the switches one way, and it will predict the weather. Set the switches another way, and it will give you a hell of a chess game. Set the switches another way, and it will balance your checkbook. The computer begins to look like the crudest approximation of the union of spirit and matter. And, and look at it. There it is. Gallium arsenide, uh, silicon, gold, platinum. But what is flowing through it? Electrons. But... These electrons flow according to the architectonic uh, uh, plans of thought. It's thought that flows in the computer, not, not its thought, our thought. We tell it what to think, and it thinks it. And as the computer shrinks, and as the data storage increases, more and more spirit is being stored 
in less and less matter. And, you know, we talked about virtual reality, we talked about implants that could create dream states, or maybe we didn't, but it was on my mind. Uh, all of these things. And, and so I think, you know, that, that through technology, we are taking our oldest intuitions, call it the intuition of the dream time, and creating it so that it is real. And the alchemical union, which was abandoned by uh, early modern science, actually will reemerge as a reasonable scientific endeavor once the new sciences of information theory and chaos theory and complexity theory and, and so forth and so on are put in place. We are in a position to create the philosopher's stone. And, you know, it will not only carry you through space, it will carry you through time. I think that's what's going on at 2012, that technology, which appears to be just a, a, a secular concern of capitalism and uh, uh, scientific R&D, is in fact uh, a, sacred, uh, a, a sacred calling and that the purpose of it is to mirror the mind of human beings through the perfection of the tool and that the perfect tool, when it arrives, will end the historical process, which was the tool-making process, and it will end it by virtue of the fact that among other features, the Philosopher's Stone allows you to move through time. And that's why that graph comes down to that place in 2012 and then can't be propagated any further because it's a picture of, of a serial, linear society unfolding. And at that point, the serial, linear society uh, uh, becomes uh, an anachronism. Yeah. You were raised Catholic and there's, at the end there's always the, uh, the sheep and the goats and then the Quran is the believers and the believers. Do you see... You mean, mean who eats it? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I have two, two impulses here. One is to say nobody eats it. That's just a bad uh, fairy tale. But, but I, and, and a lot of people, this is something that sometimes brings people clawing their way out of their seats to get at me. But it goes back to what I said earlier. I, I think redemption is an act of intellectual apprehension. And I had a professor when I went to college, Joe Tussman, and what he claimed was that intelligence is something that you can teach that we have been entirely misled to think of intelligence as something innate that you're born with. And uh, he was a teacher, and he, he seemed to make good on his premise. So what I, I, if, if evil exists, and I'm not sure it does, it, it is ignorance, which is a Hindu position, you know, avidya. Avidya, obscuring avidya, ignorance. I, so I think that, that there is an obligation to understand. To understand. I'm not putting aside the obligation to love and to feel, but those obligations seem to have their defenders everywhere. But there is an obligation to understand. And uh, ignorance is ignorance. It's not a good thing. There's no way it is good to not know something. And, I, you know, one of the things that I come up against, and we had a hu humorous brush with it last night, is that uh, this thing that I talk about, the time wave, requires a knowledge of history. 
a, a slight knowledge. Nobody has it. Nobody has it. And, you know, I go to Germany and I lecture this stuff. And when I first started going to Europe, I thought, oh, well, this will really be fun. These Europeans, they're, they, they're, it's a better educational system. They'll know what's up. They don't know what's up. You know, I talk about Otto the Great. They can't place him within 500 years. Uh, generally, the audiences occasionally someone can. Well, uh, amnesia is a pathology in the individual. If you have an individual who can't account for where they were in 1990, then you need to look into, uh, what was it, a blow on the head, uh, a long drunk? What happened to you? And yet in ourselves, we accept this weird historyless thing. And it's going to bite us in the ass. Uh, you know, it's, it's a cliche to say those who don't learn from history are bound to repeat it. But that's all very fine if you're running around throwing spears and pulling catapults around. But if you have atom bombs, you can't be so stupid. So one of the things that I, you know, that occurs to me is uh, we human beings come equipped with something called the unconscious mind discovered by Freud and Jung in Vienna, you know, for us, but apparent throughout history, uh, the unconscious mind. And part of this technological and historical crisis that we're in has to do with the fact that we can no longer afford this luxury. Th this is fine if you're, as I say, chipping flint or running around howling at the moon. Then you can have an unconscious mind. But a global civilization cannot have an irrational, uh, an out-of-control component driving its uh, social systems and social decisions. So I, part of what we all have to do is get smarter. And psychedelics, consciousness expanding drugs, expand consciousness. And so do these technologies. And I think I said to you the, the little joke about how a computer is simply a drug that you can't swallow. Uh, in the future, that won't be true. I mean, the, the, the computers of the future will be the size of, of uh, double-aught capsules if, or smaller. And they, can't, they probably will be taken internally and just insert themselves in your tissue and grow gold fibers into your brain systems and interact with you. Well, now, are we talking about a drug or a machine? And the answer is th that biology is very machine-like at the microphysical level. You know, the genes are being read, the ribosomes are connecting the proteins together. The whole thing looks rather like uh, a, a factory of moving mechanical parts. But the databases that are being created and the protocols for moving through them are uh, permission to a new level of intelligence. The, the internet, I find, truly awesome. I mean, when you get in there, you, 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 I start out from my home in Occidental, and then I ask a question which requires act, that the internet access the main computer at Shibuya University in southern Tokyo. We're there. I, if I'm not paying attention, I don't even realize that we are now talking to the university computer there. But then we need a certain image of a certain painting. Well, it turns on, it's online in a database at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. We are there. And in a session, you know, you may move around the world ten times. I have an automatic system on my computer at home that goes on in the middle of the night and has a series of key words probed in, programmed into it, things I'm interested in. And in the 
quiet hours of the night, my computer moves from one university data system to another, looking for files and downloading them into my system so that when I get up in the morning, I have these files on screen. I mean, I'm interested in a dying cult in Iran, a, a religion that's existed for a very long time but is now down to a few hundred people. Well, there's a scholar in Leipzig who is interested in this. There are some people at the UN. We carry on a little interest group. And uh, there are even real Mandaeans in our interest group, actual members of this dying religion. It's a special concern of mine, and I'm fairly confident I'm connected up to 90% of the people in the world who care about this, because so few do care. So you build these interest groups. You can expand your eccentricity. It's a tremendous permission for eccentricity and community because you find the other eccentrics who are into the same weird subset of knowledge that you are. And then the other thing is general knowledge is much more accessible and available. You know, schools have not changed essentially in 200 years. And yet education is the thing which allows us to be democratic societies and to control our industrial policies and make informed decisions. Think of the change that has occurred in society in those 200 years, and people are still going to the little red schoolhouse and sitting at their desks. And I mean, yes, we have playgroup and you know, indirect lighting, but hardly the revolution that we're looking for. Anything else? I'm just rambling here.